Alice in Wonderland Syndrome. The moment Alice arrives in Wonderland, she goes through a series of strange metamorphic changes, becoming larger or smaller after ingesting certain foods and liquids. These sensations are also experienced by individuals with many medical conditions termed Alice in, in Wonderland syndrome was first described in 1955 by a British psychiatrist Dr. John Todd. He noticed that many of his younger patients experienced distortions in the size of objects or body parts, metamorphopsia as a result of their migraines. He noted a strong association between strong association between these symptoms and migraines and determined that Alice in Wonderland syndrome may constitute a rare migraine variant. In fact, Lewis Carroll himself is reported to have suffered from migraines and manifested his experiences in his writing. For instance, Alice being blinded by, mo blinded by moonlight may refer to the tendency of bright light to stimulate or intensify a migraine. Alice in Wonderland syndrome is commonly experienced during childhood and tends to disappear during teenage years. In addition to distortions of size, patients may also experience changes in the shape or, dis or distance of objects and a distorted perception of time. These sensations may be accompanied by a lingering of sensory input, such as auditory or tactile sensations after the source has been removed. A migraine aura is a perceptual disturbance that precedes the migraine headache, but in some cases, the aura may be experienced alone. The aura typically develops over five minutes and can last up to two hours. Although its exact cause is unknown, it may be due to a slow propagation of excitation followed by a depression in neuronal activity across the cerebral cortex. This phenomenon is called cortical spreading depression and often originates in the visual or somatosensory cortex, moving across the cortex at a rate of 3.5 mm per minute. It is thought that when this ripple of overstimulation and subsequent depression of neuronal activity passes over the parietal lobe, it caused an altered perception of the sides and body parts, along with misperceptions of tactile and auditory sensations. The parietal lobe is responsible for integrating sensory information, creates the perception of our body parts in space, proprioception. It has thus been implicated in some of the symptoms experienced in Alice in Wonderland syndrome. For example, electrical stimulation of the posterior parietal cortex has been shown to produce disturbances in body image, such as hallucinations of limbs growing or disappearing. In addition, a functional MRI study of a 12-year-old with Alice in Wonderland syn and syndrome showed increased activation of the parietal lobe accompanied with reduced activation in visual cortex areas during an episode of metamorphopsia. This suggests that metamorphopsia in Alice in Wonderland syndrome patients is a result of enhanced neuronal activity within the frontal lobe, resulting in disruption of sensory information and misperceptions of body parts in space. Let me think, was I the same when I got up this morning? I almost think I can remember feeling a little different. But if I am not the same, the next question is who in the world am I? Alice questions her own identity and feels diff questions her own identity and feels different in some way from when she first woke. Approximately 1% of the UK population experience these feeling constantly, and suffer from a syndrome known as depersonalization disorder. Depersonalization disorder is characterized by a disruption in the integration of perceiving a disordered and fragmented sense of self. This disorder encompasses a wide range of symptoms, including feelings of not belonging in one's own body, a lack of ownership of thoughts and memories, that movements are initiated without conscious intention and a numbing of emotions. Patients often comment that they, that they feel as though they are not really there in the present moment, likening the experience to dreaming or watching a movie. These symptoms occur in the absence of psychosis, and patients are usually aware of the absurdity of their situation. Depersonalization disorder is often a feature of migraine or epileptic aurums experienced momentarily by healthy individuals, in response to stress, tiredness or drug use. There is a high association between depersonalization disorder and childhood abuse. The onset of symptoms often coincides with stressful or life-threatening situations, 
which indicates it may arise as an adaptive response to an overwhelming situation. Depersonalization disorder acts as a sort of defense mechanism, allowing an individual to become disconnected from adverse life events, making the situation easier to deal with. In fact, it is estimated that 51% of patients with depersonalization disorder also meet the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. The temporoparietal junction is involved in integrating sensory information to create the feeling of being located in a particular body in a particular space. As well as the feeling of not belonging in their body, people with depersonalization disorder may also have out-of-body experiences, the feeling that the self is located outside the physical body and experience autoscopy, the perception of viewing the self from another vantage point. Evidence for the involvement of the temporoparietal junction in depersonalization disorder comes from studying becomes from studying brain lesions. It has been shown that neuronal degeneration of the temporoparietal junction produces out-of-body experiences, possibly due to a failure to integrate multisensory information from the body. Likewise, Transcranial magnetic stimulation of the right temporoparietal temporoparite junction reduces symptoms of depersonalization. People with depersonalization disorder also have reduced activity in the anterior insula of the brain, which is located deep within the brain and necessary conscious processing of emotions and creating a sense of agency, the feeling of responsibility for your own actions. Functional MRI studies have shown that activation of the anterior insula occurs when healthy subjects are shown photos of their face or body, implicating this area in bodily representation and feelings of ownership. Reduced basal activity in the anterior insula of people with depersonalization disorder offers a possible explanation for the loss of agency and robotic automated movements which are experienced by individuals with depersonalization disorder. Reduced activation of the anterior insula is responsible for the emotional numbing experienced by these patients. Patient a lack of response when shown emotionally provocative images, accompanied by reduced activation in the anterior insula and a dampening of the galvanic skin response as compared to controls. The galvanic skin response is a measure of subconscious arousal and is therefore often used as a quantitative measure of emotional response. Another brain region implicated in emotional awareness is the amygdala, which also displays dampened activity among depersonalization disorder patients. The amygdala is thought to color conscious perceptions with emotion and plays an important part of how we perceive our environment. It has been suggested that this of perception may occur by two parallel pathways. The first is concerned with the literal, semantic processing of the environment, the what is it? pathway. The second pathway assigns emotional significance to this information. In people with depersonalization disorder, the what is it, is intact, however the emotional pathway is disrupted. This may cause patients to feel that things seem somehow different and unreal. Therefore, patients with depersonalization disorder are able to recognize themselves, their families and their environment. As the emotional coloring of the situation is null coloring of the situation is lost, everything appears foreign and lifeless. Goodbye, till we meet again. Alice said as cheerfully as she could. I shouldn't know you again if we did meet, Humpty Dumpty replied in a discontented tone. Your face is the same as everybody else has, the two eyes everybody else has, the two eyes, so marking their places in the air with his thumb nose in the middle, mouth under. It's always the same. Now if you had two eyes on the same side of the nose, for instance or the mouth at the top, that would be some help. As Alice says her goodbyes to Humpty Dumpty, he gives her a precise description of prosopognosia, a rare form of agnosia characterized by the selective inability to recognize faces. Whether Carol based Humpty Dumpty's prosopognosia on a real person or was simply a fragment of his imagination is unclear. This account is possibly one of the earliest apognosia in the literature. Humpty describes his impairment in recognition of familiar faces, even though he is aware of the general organization of a face and is able to correctly identify the position of facial features. Prosopognosia is either caused by brain trauma, 
likely the result of Humpty's great fall, Humpty's great fall, stroke or neurodegeneration or it may manifest in childhood. Prosopognosia has been shown to be strongly hereditary although any causative genes are yet to be discovered. People with prosopognosia tend to rely on discriminating features to tell people apart, such as hairstyle, glasses and the press individuals also have difficulty recognizing themselves in the mirror, as well as following plot lines when watching films. Due to the fact that the brain links information learned about people to the visual memory of that person, it can be difficult for prosopognosics to attribute specific information to the right people and socialize specific information to the right people and socialize normally with others. This can result in social withdrawal, anxiety and loss of confidence in social situations, which is fueled by a lack of awareness of prosopognosia in the general population. Prosopognosia has been linked to damage in the fusiform temporal lobes which is responsible for retaining visual memories. A localized region within the fusiform gyrus, termed the fusiform face area retains the facial images of people we have met throughout our lifetime, and this is the area affected in prosopognosics. FMRI studies have shown a strong and a strong activation of the fusiform face area when participants are shown photos of faces, as compared to other visual stimuli. Amusingly, Experimental electrical disruption of the fusiform face area causes distortions when visualizing faces, an effect similar to viewing oneself in a funhouse oneself in a funhouse mirror. In one study, when current was applied to the right fusiform gyrus, facial recognition is altered, as it is dominated by the right hemisphere. There is evidence that the fusiform face area may process not just faces, but any familiar visual stimuli in which the brain has to recognition of faces depends not only on the ability to correctly match the visual image of a face from the catalogue of faces stored in our memory, but also on the emotions which we associate with a familiar face. Whilst the fusiform gyrus is responsible for the visual recognition of faces, it appears that other higher brain centers, higher brain centers provide the emotional response when seeing a familiar face. The normal process of facial recognition occurs by two distinct circuits, the first involving the conscious awareness of a particular face due to retained imagery in the fusiform face area, and secondly an unconscious emotional familiarity emotional familiarity mediated by higher brain regions particularly the frontal and parietal lobes. In prosopognosics, the emotional circuit is intact so the patient is able to detect familiar faces unconsciously but the brain fails to pass on this information to higher brain centers. Therefore, the condition of prosopognosia appears to reflect a structural disconnection between areas of the brain involved in recognizing faces. The opposite scenario is reflected in a condition known as hyperfamiliarity. In this disorder, the patient has a strong gut familiarity with people and places due to strong activity in emotional centers, and may even go up to people to greet them as old friends, even though the individual cannot recall meeting these people in the past. A more common phenomenon of familiarity without awareness is deja vu. Despite the fact that symptoms of Alice in Wonderland syndrome, Realization and prosopognosia can be distressing, they provide insight into the neural mechanisms which produce fundamental processes such as consciousness and perception which we ordinarily take for granted. Through slight changes in neural activity in relatively localized brain regions, phenomena can arise which are as, pecu as peculiar and fascinating as those experienced by Alice when she first fell down the rabbit hole.